योगेन चित्तस्य पदेन वाचाम शरीर से वैद्यकन योपाकृत प्रवर मुनीना पदंजलि प्राजलि आनतूस्म स्वे पदंजलि व्यास शंकर मुनी कर्तसूत्र भाष्य से क्रमाण से Some of these uh, sutras are highly philosophical, and unlike the previous sutras, eh, I mean that we discussed till now, these sutras refer to some of the prominent schools of Indian philosophy, especially the Buddhist school. So, I think I discussed uh, the. Thirteenth Sutra of Skyvilya Pada. So today we discuss this fourteenth Parinama Yagatvad Vastu Tattum and Vastu Swami Chitta Bheda Tayoku Vibhakta Pantha. Two sutras are very very important, and also the next one, of course, Najayga Chitta Tantram Vastu Tada Pramanagam Tada Kim Sia. So these sutras. Uh, are interpreted by commentators um, as a reference to some of the uh, philosophical schools which are prevalent during Patanjali's time. So, in fact, some of these sutras have given rise to the popular view among scholars that Patanjali lived uh, after Buddha. But we have to remember uh, the interpretation comes mostly from Vyasa. So connecting these sutras with Vijnana Vada is essentially a contribution of Vyasa and, of course, the succeeding lineage of commentators. So the first sutra is Parinamegatva Vastu Tattum. What it means is this. Um, I mentioned this earlier. Ekatum means parinama ekatum. Three guna, sattva guna, rajo guna, and tamo guna. When they evolve together, that the result is object. In other words, the compact. Unity and oneness of all objects are due to the simultaneous evolution from prakriti. And prakriti, we should remember, prakriti of pravana. Uh, it consists of sattva guna, rajo guna, and tamo guna. So when these three gunas evolve together, the result is this objective world. Now. It is in this context that uh, potentially, or maybe Vyasa, to be more precise, refers to some of the uh, existing schools of thought in Buddhism. Vastu Sami Chitta Bheda, Kayoko Vibhakta Panthava. This sutra cannot be understood unless we understand, we get a full picture of Vijnana Vada. So, Vijnana Vada essentially. Implies that uh, objective world doesn't have an existence independent of a perceiving mind. In other words, when you perceive an object, then only that object has an ontological reality. See, this is the Vijnana Vada view. I shall try to explain this in the light of um, some of the fundamental texts in Vijnana Vada. To begin with, a brief introduction to the evolution of Buddhist thought. So, those of you uh, who may, uh, who are listening to this for the first time, when, we, when I refer to Buddhism, you may get the wrong impression that Padanjali is talking about Buddha or Buddha's teachings. Absolutely wrong. Remember, Vijnana Vada 
it's also called subjective idealism coming from scholars like dharmagirti and others this vijnanavada is a school of philosophy that developed maybe around 400 years after buddha's passing away buddha originally did not give rise to any of these philosophical systems buddha's teachings were basically uh, a kind of applied humanistic interpretation of upanishadic philosophy so whatever he taught were recorded in pali canonical literature which are known as tripitaka sutta pitaka vinaya pitaka abhidhamma pitaka which all together deal with the buddhist disciplines to be practiced to be followed by buddhist monks some of the fundamental philosophical doctrines sutta pitaka contains this dhammapada which is a highly philosophical works not very large work small work and abhidhamma pitaka so sutta pitaka vinaya pitaka abhidhamma pitaka which all deal with different aspects of buddhist monastic order disciplines and also well, highly humanistic ethical uh, teachings of buddha uh, almost 300 years 350 years after buddha's passing away which must have taken place according to some scholars at 480 bc uh, different schools of buddhism evolved is called the four schools of later buddhism they are known as sautrantika and vaibhashika which are realistic schools implying that they accepted uh, the reality of external objects independent of the perceiving mind that's the implication of realism in buddhist tradition more or less in, in you know of course it is different from phenomenalism as understood in western philosophy but anyway uh the two the two schools of realism uh, linked to hinayana buddhism is called sautrantika and vaibhashika schools of philosophy they accepted the reality of an objective world independent of a perceiving mind they are realistic realistic schools mostly linked to hinayana school of buddhism more traditional they gave more importance to the pali canonical literature the other school called mahayana buddhism um, that that's a source of two schools of idealism one is shunyavada the other is vijnanavada of shunyavada uh, taught that um, that is truth existence dissolution all these are relative and all these are linked to our sankalpas our thoughts and what buddha taught was only the relative phenomenon this called you know according to the school of shunyavada these are very important to understand the deeper implications of these two three sutra that's why i'm trying to explain it's not easy of course to give a full picture of these different schools of philosophy but it is important to understand uh, what vijnanavada actually implies and to understand vijnanavada you should also know the other school of idealism called shunyavada so according to the shunyavada there are uh, two types of truths one is uh, samvridhi satya or relative phenomenal reality that is the universe and everything else the other is paramarthika satya aupacharika satya and paramarthika satya samvridhi satyam and paramarthika satyam the relative and the absolute and absolute reality is shunya it is beyond all descriptions and definitions so nagarjuna says in the madhyamika karika mula madhyama shastra which is the bible of shunyavada 
ಸರ್ವೌಬಲಂಭೌಬಲಂಭೋಶಮ ಪ್ರಪಂಚೋಪಶಮ ಶಿವ ನ ಕ್ವಚಿತ್ ಕಶ್ಚಿತ್ ಕಶ್ಚಿತ್ ಧರ್ಮೋ ಬುದ್ಧೇನ ದೇಶಿತ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಬುದ್ಧ ಡಿಡ್ ನಾಟ್ ಟೀಚ್ ದಿಸ್ ಹೈಯೆಸ್ಟ್ ಟ್ರೂತ್ ಆಫ್ ಶೂನ್ಯ ಟು ಎನಿ ಒನ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ಇಟ್ ಕೆ ನಾಟ್ ಬಿ ಥಾಟ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಷನ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ಡೆಫಿನಿಷನ್ and is aprahinam asampraptam anuchinnam ashashudam aniruddham anutpannam edat nirvanam uchyade this is the definition of spiritual enlightenment according to madhyamika kariga which again remember it is the bible of shunyavada school of buddhist idealism those who want to see the text you can see the, maybe the uh, 25th chapter third verse that is aprahinam asampraptam anuchinnam ashashudam nirvanam or spiritual enlightenment is defined by shunyavada in this language aniruddham anutpannam edat nirvanam uchyade what is nirvana nirvana is something that you cannot get rid of and you cannot obtain it it is neither eternal nor non eternal it is neither beginning nor end so in other words it is beyond description beyond verbalization beyond definition and the it is the ultimate goal of all human beings to reach this nirvana when you get beyond the transmigratory cycle of pradeetya samutpada which means we go beyond this birth life and death and these three levels of existence and we become one with our own absolute reality which is shunya which is beyond definition description and verbalization this is shunyavana shunyavada idealism which did not accept anything as a objective existence now in total contrast to this another school of uh idealism developed in buddhism remember all this happened centuries after buddha's passing away so when you are reading this listening to this and when you find the vyasa in his commentary on yoga sutras and later you can find all these ideas much more uh, uh, in a much more profound language explained by shankaracharya in this refutation of vijnanavada you should remember they were not refuting buddha's teachings they were refuting some philosophical schools which emerged in buddhist tradition centuries after buddha's passing away maybe 400 years after buddha's passing away people who don't understand this philosophical uh, lineage and tradition will suddenly get the wrong impression that patanjali refuted buddha the buddha is a great man great humanist so people who don't understand this tradition people who don't keep in mind that vijnanavada or buddhist school of subjective idealism is actually much more profound than george berkeley's subjective idealism is 18th century philosophical school which actually is very superficial because with this subjective idealism is very very profound and all the historians of western thought also acknowledge the fact that uh, any trace of uh, subjective idealism that you find in plato and of course uh, later on in berkeley's uh, classical works that is only a distant echo of the ideas of dignaga uh, vasubandhu and other asanga and other buddhist philosophers were actually the the ex- great exponents of vijnanavada now what did vijnanavada teach one important teaching was samsaram swapnam ayakyam na cha karma vinashyati that it means this external world this world objective world it is actually non existent except when we perceive it so when you perceive a chair in front of you 
then it has got an ontological status. If you don't perceive it, it doesn't exist. That's because Buddh these Vijnanavadins believe the Vijnanam or Chittam alone exists. So in the Patanjali Yoga Sutra, you find two terms, Vastu and Chittam you find. Vastu means Vastu or Artha means an object, objective world, what you perceive. The perceived object is Vastu. Chitta means the perceiving mind. So external object has no existence independent of the perceiving mind. To that extent, Vijnanavada can be said to be the, the, origin, the original source of uh, Berkeley's subjective idealism. But Berkeley brings in God. He says, for example, the entire universe of creation is a is a creation of different independent, different individual minds and God's mind. Now, uh, the Vijnanavada scholars, uh, thinkers like uh, the Naga, Vasubandhu and others, they don't bring God idea at all. They are, in that respect, they are very, very objective. So, they say, me sunyada nityam shashudu chedavarjidam samsaram supnamaya kyam necha karma vinashyadi. That is a important statement that coming from that's coming from Langavadara Sutra, which is one of the important texts in Buddhist tradition. It is a well-known text. It is important mostly for Vijnanavadis and sometimes Sunivadins also quote this. Now, now you can come to this sutra proper because you deal with this background. And when we read Vyasa's commentary, we will know more about this. Now, in the sutra, you find. Vastu Sami Chitta Bheda Tayoko Vibhakta Pantha. This is the 15th Sutra. What it means? The Vijnanavadin's view that object and chittam awareness or knowledge or understanding, they are the same. In other words, an object has no existence other than its awareness in our mind. Now, this is absolutely unacceptable. That is what Patanjali says. Patanjali says this is totally unacceptable. And of course, Vyasa will place before you many arguments. Vastu Samya. Vastu Samya actually means, you know, it means um, mind and object they are the same. This view of Vijnanavadins, if you accept this, then how do you explain Chitta Bheda? You may see an object and that object will create one sensation in your mind. Suppose you get, a, you get the news that suddenly you have become a millionaire. That kind of language at least most of you will understand. Suddenly, you feel you have hit a huge lottery. Maybe you have, your share has gone up and you have hit it. Maybe you suddenly uh, have got, uh, I mean, your share stocks have gone up and you get $1 million suddenly. And now, somebody who is not friendly with you, that person will listen to this news with a different mindset, a different approach. If you go to a museum, let us say you are seeing an object, hundreds of, maybe thousands of people, thousands of people may look at the same object in a museum. These hundreds of people, thousands of people do not have the same identical sensation. Some people may be happy, some people will be less happy, and some people may not be very happy at all. When somebody who is not your friend hears the news that you have got, $1 million, he may not be very happy about it. You are very happy. Your friends are very happy about it. So, event or objects and mind are the same. Then the sensation response of the mind to the same event, the same object should be identical. So, Chitta Bheda means there is a difference with regard to the reaction of the mind. Chitta means Bheda means difference. So, Sometimes 
mind will be happy about an object, seeing an object, or experiencing some event. Sometimes mind will be unhappy. Sometimes will be depressed. So why is this difference? If object and mind are the same, then thousand people having an experience will have the same identical experience. Not necessarily. We also will have one experience now when we see an object. And after some time, uh, that object may produce its opposite a, a feeling in our mind. So why this difference? Chitta Bheda, there is a difference in terms of uh, our reaction, our sensation in our chitta or mind. In other words, one object, but many mental perceptions, many mental sensitivities. Therefore, of Therefore, they may not be the same. Object doesn't change. Uh, if, if in your maybe uh, you pursue a chair, maybe you you are looking at a great painting, and you are a great painter yourself, or, or, or you may be seeing a great uh, architectural ma uh, marvel. If you are yourself an architect, architect, you may appreciate. Uh, the, uh, the architectural manual, man, marvel in one way. If you see Taj Mahal, if you see pyramid, if you are a historian, if you are a, yourself an architect, you may feel extremely elevated. But somebody who is not trained in architecture may not be able to have the same appreciation of this wonderful pyramid uh, as you, because you are trained in appreciating the beauty of architecture. Your friend may not be trained so, but the pyramid is the same. Pyramid object is the same. But at the same time, two minds, two persons uh, look at the same object uh, differently. Vastu Samya means identity, sameness. The same object, but Chitta Bheda, but mind perceives in two different ways or maybe so many different ways. And our own uh, reaction sensibility can change, can become happy, unhappy, and so on. Well, now we are happy, another time we may be unhappy with regard to the same object. Therefore, uh, Padanjali says, mind and object are two different things. In other words, he says that objective world has an ontological status, ontological existence, independent of perceiving minds. That means it's a complete refutation of Buddhist Vijnanavada and of course um, it, because Buddhist Vijnanavada the, the literature is very huge and very very deep so uh, it, it goes much deeper than Berkeley's uh, Vijnanavada. So this is the way. Now if you look at the commentary, it's very very important commentary. It's a very famous commentary. Before going to the uh, 15th Sutra, I shall just read the last portion of Vyasa's commentary on the 14th Sutra, where Vyasa begins uh, to make his views very clear with regard to Vijnanavada. So the commentary is just the last paragraph of Vyasa's commentary. Nasti artho Vijnana Visakacharaha Asti to Jnana Martham Visagacharam Sopmadu Kalpidam Idianaya Disha Ye Vastu Sudupam Abaknuvade Jnana Parigal Parama from Bastu Sopna Vishiopamum Naparamarta Daga Astidi Ye Ahu Te Tata Idi Portibusta Bidam Samahat Vena Vastu Katam Apramana Vena Vigalpa Jnana Belena, Vastu Surubam Utsridhya, Tadeva Apalavantaha, Sadeya Vajana Siku. It's very famous. And of course, it refers to some of the previous sutras of Padanjali. So, at the beginning, Vyasa is refer, refuting the Vijnanavada Buddhist view of, maybe it means Vijnanavadis negate the object, the reality of the objective universe 
Vyasa says, no, objective universe does have a reality. Object, uh, objects do have an existence independent of mind or perceiving mind. Now, the commentary is this. Nasti arthaka vijnana visaka charaka asti. That means, to people, I mean, vijnana vadin say, vijnana visaka charaka asti artha nasti means objective world or external objects have no real existence independent or devoid of mental perception. This is the argument. And then and they say, you know, what is the argument? Their argument is there is no object without being perceived with consciousness. In other words, you know, that's their view. If there is an object, it exists only so long as we perceive it. Without an, without an object, there is no awareness. In other words, there is uh, awareness without object, but there is no object without awareness. So what they say, you perceive a chair and the chair is gone. Maybe somebody has taken away that chair, but your awareness of the existence of that chair is still in your mind and they remain as memory, sensation, samskaras, vasanas, etc. But object is gone. In other words, your awareness remains in your mind. But the external objects of which you are aware, that is gone. It can disappear. You may have seen something yesterday, this morning, but it's not there in front of you. But its awareness, its knowledge is there in your mind. Therefore, awareness can exist independent of object. Objects cannot exist independent of awareness. Awareness means vijnana. Yeah, so you can say awareness, vijnana, chittam, knowledge, all these should be more or less understood to be identical in this particular context. So this is the argument. This is the vijnana vadin's argument, remember which Vyasa is not willing to agree. Means there is no object without being associated with awareness or Vijnana. But without an object, it is possible for you to have knowledge or Vijnana. This is the argument. So, Nasti artho Vijnana Visaka Charaka Asti to Jnana Artham Visaka Charam So, it means, for example, in dreams, for example, in dream, you see many things. You are aware of all. You, there are awareness, but those things may not exist in the external world. But awareness is there. So awareness is greater than external objects. External objects are dependent upon awareness. Vastu is dependent upon vijnanam or chittam. That's the implication here. So sopnadu, like, like daydreaming, maybe daydream also. Dream also, daydream also. Kalpidam idi anaya disha ye vastu sarupam avaknuvade. In other words, they, they, refute, they, they refute the reality of objects. They refuse to accept the reality uh, of external object. Vastu means external object. Saruva means its existence. Avaknuvade means they refuse to accept or they reject. This is Vijnana view, Vijnana Vadin's view. Jnana parigal pranamatram vastu. In other words, an object is nothing but a parigal pana, a perception taking place in the mind. Objective universe uh, have no, has no existence independent of the perceiving mind. And you know, they say object is only, object is only a creation of mind, that's their view. An external object is only creation of mind. This is the Vijnana Vadin's view. Sopna Vishyopamam na Paramartha Stidi. This is the view. I mean, external objects have no real reality. Paramartha 
nasty in reality external objects do not exist it is only a creation of mind or perception te tatha idi pratibusthapitam sama now they talk like that now the point is external objects so mahatmena vastu actually external objects exist independent of whether they are perceived by you or not why because if you are not perceiving an external object another person is perceiving suppose there is a chair in front of you you close your eyes gnanavadin will tell you the chair doesn't exist because you, you don't see it you don't perceive it except in memory but another person looking at the same chair is perceiving that chair so you can find if it is just a if it just an a creation of the mind then uh, the external object should cease to exist when you don't perceive it even for others but others continue experiencing that object you may have closed your eyes but others have opened their eyes they perceive it so vyasa uses a strong language here you know katham apramanagatvena vigalpa jnana belena vigalpa you know vigalpa is one of the vrittis vrittaya panchadaiya you know you can find pramana vibhriya vigalpa nidra sprute these are the five vrittis what is vigalpa vigalpa is shabda jnanuvadi vastu shunya it is just a just a verbal just verbal formation see for example vandhya putra gandharva nagara akha pushpa let us say a sky sorry a flower in the sky akha pushpa or gandharva nagara a city in the sky just a verbal expression is not even a pramana it is just a verbal expression without a corresponding reality that's how vijnanavadins interpret this world samsaram swapnamayakhyam i already quoted from lankavadara sutra earlier lankavadara sutra is a very important document for vijnanavadins so dinaga vasugandhu or chandag all of them accept that as an important text so vyasa says uh, buddhist vijnanavadins tell you that this external world is only vikalpa vikalpa means shabda jnana anubadi vastu shunyaha vikalpa vastu shunyaha there is no object but it is just a word a verbal expression let us say uh, 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 for example the the horns of a hare hair cannot have forms but it is possible for you to construct such a word that is a word without a corresponding reality like that vijnanavadins tell you the external world is only a vikalpa and then he is asking a question vastu sarupam utsrijya they reject the reality of external objects tadeva balavanta sadhya vajana sihu so how can you uh, how can you consider their words to be authentic to be taken seriously this is the conclusion of vyasa's commentary on i think is a 14th sutra so again you know samsaram swapnamaya kim nacha karma vinashi karma desin cease to exist but samsara external world it has no existence other than when other than when you are aware of it other than the form of awareness in your mind this is the 14th sutra after that we will come to uh, i think the 15th sutra before that of course uh, we have to uh, i think we have to this uh, the well known statement is there which i already made i think here yeah. so so uh, here of course you have to remember uh, to understand this especially in the next sutra uh, which is which is more famous and the sutra is vastu sami chitta bhed 
chitta bheda payoko vibhakta pantha we'll discuss this now what it fundamentally means is vastu samya object is the same but chitta bheda mind perceives different Uh, the same object makes one person happy another person unhappy so the chitta bheda is there vastu samya means object is the same therefore the object should have an entity existence independent of the perceiving mind that's the argument the padajali is putting forward so the commentary is very famous here bahu chitta avalambani bhutam ekam vastu sadharanam existence by itself that's what vyasa says tat khalu naika chitta parigalpidam napi aneka chitta parigalpidam kindu supradishtham whether ebbun whether one person or one mind or several persons several minds perceive an object or not the object does have a independent existence this is what vyasa is saying here bahu chitta avalambani bhutam ekam vastu sadharanam it is very common we can find the same object in bahu chitta avalambani bhutam it is it is it is it, 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 it is the object of many kinds of perceptions many perceiving minds creating different sensations in different minds same object therefore that objective world should have an indi indiki now in its more extreme form of vijnanavada you find some of them will tell you that you have eaten food you have drunk water you are it is real it's real only so long as only so long as you are aware of it but shankaracharya actually in this uh, brahma sutra there is one sutra na bhava upalabdhih but it means he say is also a refutation of vijnanavada especially for, put forward by asanga uh, vasubandhu and others a very famous sutra means so vijnanavada one of the well known books is called vijnapti matrada siddhi and vasubandhu has written a commentary is called vimshatika is called vijnapti matram evaidat everything is vijnapti vijnapti means vijnanam mental perception the whole universe is nothing but mental perception you can you can see how berkeley must have got this idea from some source or other some some translations of the vijnanavada books because the idea doesn't occur any time uh, before buddhist philosophy especially vasubandhu who is a uh, Which actually wrote this Vimshatika, which is a commentary on Vikyapti Matra Da Siddhi, famous text on Yoga Chara. Yoga Chara is another term for Vijnana Vada philosophy. So Vasubandhu he makes a statement: Vikyapti Matram Eva Itat Asat Arthav Bhasanat Itha Taimari Gasya Asat Yesha Di Darshan. And he says, suppose you have a problem with your eyes. uh you may see certain things though they may not be existing so like this you now suppose a person has a problem with his eyes and he is looking at an object he may see that object in totally is uh, totally different from how it is perceived by others that distorted perception is the reality so far as that person is concerned because the this, this the, the problem the, the problem with his eyes can only give him a distorted vision distorted understanding of that object 
So if you've got a problem with your eye, you may see an object, a white object you may see as, as yellow, a yellow object you may see as white. So far as you're concerned, it is what you perceive. The object itself is yellow or white, depending upon the condition of your eyes. That is the view of Vijnanavad. That's why, you know, Vijnapti Matram Evaidad. Evaidad Sarvam Vijnapti Matram. Everything is only Vijnanam perception. Asat Arthavasana Yatha Taimirikasya Asat Keshali Das. A person may not have hairs, but if you have a problem with your eyes, then you may see a person endured with long hair. That is, um, this well-known uh, writer. Uh, he's, of course, remember, these, all these ideas have themselves some very profound implications. It's a, the glorious evolution of world thought. At least you can find the co in the, in the later subject idealists like uh, um, a, the subject idealism of Berkeley, George Berkeley. Shankaracharya, he tries to respond to this view of Vijnanavada. That is very well, very interesting to see. Vijnanavadins will tell you, suppose you had, you had a wonderful meal and you have eaten food. Uh, Vijnanavadins will tell you, so long as you remember that you have a wonderful meal, it is real, otherwise it is not. Devam prapte bhumaha na bhava ulabdehi di kalu says Nakalu abhavo bahiartha sadhyavasadum chakke de kasma uvalabdehi uvalabdehi pradipatiam bahiartha sambhava putem gada padaidi. This means Yetaki kastit bunjano bujisadhyayam truktu sayam and buyamanayam eva ruya naham bunje navatrupyami di. Yam evam buya na akam bunje nava tripyamidi. No, no, I, somebody had a wonderful meal. But according to Vijnana Vadins, that, that is a real reality only, so long as the person remembers or aware or still retains his, in his mind a memory that he had a wonderful meal. Otherwise, he did not have uh, that, that, that uh, it doesn't exist. Similarly, when you see an external object, kutyam stampa, kutyam ghata padayidi, you see a wall or maybe a pillar or maybe a pot, maybe cloth, all these are there. Now, these are real only so long as the awareness exists in your mental system. Otherwise, they have no reality. Shankaracharya says, the pot is there, the wall is there, the cloth is there, but they are not, they will not be there all the time. A pot in the shape of an object in which you can store water made of clay. That is there, but that is there only so long as it remains in that shape, in that form. Then it's called kata, means a pot. You break it, it becomes mrut, becomes clay. So it exists only for the time being. And all these exist for the time being, but they are not totally non-existent. This is an important point in Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedantins do not reject the reality of external world. They only will tell you that this external world doesn't exist all the time. They are not eternal. Why? Because they, they are subject to changes. You break a pot, it changes, it becomes clay. A pot maker turns, uh, he, pro he produces, a, 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 he manufactures a pot out of clay. So the clay becomes the pot to change and you break it, the pot goes back to its clay form. That means it changes. So it means it is not absolutely real, but it is not absolutely unreal. It is subject to changes. It is relative. 
So actually, uh, Shankaracharya in his commentaries, he brings about a reconciliation uh, between, uh, you may call it subjective idealism and objective idealism. Objective idealism will tell you that external world is externally real. And subjective idealism will tell you that external, external world exists only so long as you perceive it. So Advaita actually brings about a reconciliation by putting forward the idea of Vyavaharika Sapta. Everything in this world is real in the relative sense. In the absolute sense, this world is not real. Similarly, in the absolute sense, in this world is not unreal. It is neither absolutely real nor absolutely unreal. It is real only in the relative sense. Or it is unreal in the relative sense. Both statements are equally correct. So having said that, let us go back to Vyasa's commentary on Patanjali Yoga Sutras. Okay, now uh, again, uh, Vyasa makes a very profound statement Tatkalu naika chitta parigal pidam, napi anega chitta parigal pidam, kindu supradishtam. He says, an object sitting in front of you has got an existence by virtue of its own existence. Whether one person perceive it, perceives it or many persons perceive it, irrespective of whether it is perceived or not, external objects do have a reality whether they are perceived or not. That is Vyasa's assertion here. Vastu sami chitta bheda dharma peksham chittasya vastu sami abhi sukha jnanam bhavadi adharma peksham tata eva dukha jnanam avidya peksham tata eva mudha jnanam samyik desana peksham tata eva madhisthik jnanam iti That means if objects and chitta, if objects and mind were the same, if objects exist only depending upon perception of the mind, then why is it that perceptions of mind can vary from person to person? Perception of the same object can be different for different persons. So he says, for example, you know, dharma peksham chittasya vastu sami abhi sukhajnanam. Suppose Suppose your mind, you are in a good mood, good samskaras. Depending upon that, when you see an object, it makes you happy. Adharma peksham, a negative samskaras, it makes you unhappy. Again, avidya peksham, suppose you have some misunderstanding or not, pro you don't have proper understanding of an object, then you'll have a delusion, you may be deluded, you may be seeing something but you don't know what object is. So avidya peksham means you are ignorant as to what it actually is. So you may have a lot of confusion. So mudhaknyanam, it can create delusions, wrong understanding and so on. So make the sinabeksham, suppose you have proper understanding, then you know what happens? Then you have a very unprejudiced, proper, objective, correct understanding. When we have correct understanding, we can have a very objective, clear perception or judgment of anything. But if we are, if we are not aware of what it is, your perception may be highly uh, cluttered or may be highly deluded. Again, it, your perception uh, of an object and your, the reaction of your mind can always depend, depend upon how your mind is, in what condition your mind is right now. If you are in a happy mood, you may you can, you can feel happy when you see an object. If you're in an unhappy mood, you will be unhappy. So dharma peksham, adharma peksham, samyik dasana peksham. So all these different conditionalities are uh, mentioned by Vyasa. If your mind is in a good samskara, in a good mood, you will have sukhajnanam. If it is in an unhappy mood, you may have dukhajnanam. It means unpleasant perception. If it is in a state of equilibrium, if your mind is 
in a state of stability, then you may have a you may very very objective proper understanding. Neither uh, uh, leaning in one direction, either either it's very good or be very bad. You will have a very proper, uh, unprejudiced, a uh, proper dispassionate understanding of an object. So all these variations with regard to perception show that objective world does have an existence independent of perceiving minds. An object exists whether it is perceived by one person or many persons. So this is how Vyasa is trying in his commentary to uh, answer, to confront the problem of the unreality of objective world proposed by Vijnanabhadis. Now you can have interaction. I know it's a bit uh, complicated, but uh, we should also uh, learn to enjoy uh, the evolution of world thought over the last several centuries. This, the, all these constitute the precious wealth of uh, human civilization, intellectual civilization especially. Thank you. We can have interaction. Most welcome. Questions? Namaskar Maharaj. So, namaskar. namaskar. Um, I was monitoring the Facebook feed, which I think may have ended. Yeah. Um, there may have been a techno technical problem there. Yeah. Uh, I, at the time that I was viewing it, I didn't see any questions. Okay. But there is a That's question. Good. There is a question and answer on the YouTube. Yeah. Um, how to? Let's see. Different levels of consciousness have different perceptions towards everything. Mind and object are different based on each chitta. We are only looking at things from the color of our lens. How to permanently become situated in this understanding? I understand it at all levels, but why do we forget it when dealing with the external world? There is a response. Um, so uh, the chat continues uh, with a response. I think the whole point is that each of our chitta is different based on many past lives and that influence each, each of our perceptions of the object. And this might be the foundation for future sutras. So the students are having a, a dialogue here. Interesting, and anyway, interesting. So uh, there are two aspects with the, uh about today's session. One is, uh, I mean, it's a bit academic and deals with the evolution of different systems of thought, Buddhist philosophy and also with yoga philosophy and also Vedanta philosophy. Uh, and the second aspect is, what are we to do with, this, with all this? So I shall deal with the later problem. But the answer is, uh, Vedanta, brings about a reconciliation between um, the two contrasting views that you may have found here. One is um, subjective idealism put forward by Vijnanavadins. They believe that everything depends upon mind. Ex uh, external objects do not have any existence independent of mind. Now, uh, that is actually a very unrealistic view. Uh, the reason why, I, I again, I had to take you back to the early centuries when these philosophical systems evolved. You know, there were two schools of realism, Sautrantikas and Vaibhashikas. They were extreme realists in Buddhist tradition. They did believe the reality of external world. So very often the idealists wrote these books in response to uh, the schools of realism that emerged within Buddhism itself. But what Shankaracharya did was, he said, well, you are right. He told Vijnanavadin, you are perfectly right that external world, external objects do not have existence. But one correction, external world doesn't have an existence in the sense it doesn't have an eternal existence. 
it changes so it is not eternally real it not real in with the capital letter r but you cannot deny the relative reality you cannot say after having a heavy meal wonderful meal you cannot say no i did not eat you are you are seen a, a, a pot in front of you and then you close your eyes you cannot say no there is no pot in front of me you cannot say that in fact that's that's the language he uses in the brahma sutra bhashya referring to that so he says external things external objects do have an existence only in the relative sense they don't they don't have an absolute existence because they they change anything that is subject to changes cannot be said to be absolutely real so they are real only in the relative sense but at the same time they are not absolutely unreal because we are experiencing this objective universe we live in this world we live we will deal with different objects in this world so we cannot deny their relative existence so shankaracharya brings about a reconciliation i that's why i mentioned earlier uh, swami vivekananda when he interpreted yoga sutras he somehow connects yoga philosophy to vedanta that is in fact that's one of the reasons why many scholars have no doubt that vyasa who wrote this commentary himself was the author of brahma sutras as one view because brahma sutras 554 sutras vyasa wrote padrayana sutra same vyasa you uh, wrote this well known padrayana uh, sutras but you had to remember that subjective idealism in india doesn't begin with vijnana vadins subjective idealism when one way or other one shade or an, uh, another did exist even during the pre buddhist period but it took a different shape with the emergence of the great buddhist scholars uh, who i mean during the post buddha period that's all. maharaj um i've often uh, seen uh, the description of the commentator vignana bikshu as a great bridge between yeah. hinduism and buddhism yeah. but from your description today it sounds as though the bridge was already there yeah bridge already was there yes yeah, yeah. vyasa let's say he vastu swami chitta bheda means with regard to same object my different minds perceive differently the same object so we cannot say that an external world external object uh, uh, doesn't independently exist independent of perception they do exist independent of perception so in the it's a, in this view is actually this also effectively refutes uh, subjective idealism of work of course you mentioned you mentioned the practical aspects the impact uh, of this uh, philosophy on us um i'm 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 curious what you meant by by the uh, practical import yeah uh, i think you know it is the idea that the external world as such uh this in count for much there is a higher truth than what we see in front of us so that view you know it slowly emerges in so many systems of philosophy i mean there is more to the reality than what we perceive with our mind and the five senses of perception so any any system of philosophy that takes you beyond phenomenalism phenomenalism you know extreme kind of realism yeah. it is always welcome so in that respect uh buddhist vijnanavada has got a great relevance any system of philosophy that takes you beyond empiricism and phenomenalism kind of extreme realism which actually reduces human beings to Uh, eating and living animals you know that's a problem if really speaking if you can if you just uh, believe that only what we see in front of us alone exist then uh, there may not be much meaning or logic for higher music uh, 
uh, higher art, literature, poetry, uh, spirituality. So there is something much more than what we see in front of us. So in that respect, the total rejection of external world that you find in, in Vijnanavada, it, it, it takes you, be, it, it takes you, catches you by the throat and it takes you out of the stranglehold of phenomenalist realism. Um, I'm going to take a risk and, and just add that it seems less mature and perhaps even arrogant to think that it only exists if I'm aware that I'm perceiving it. That, that <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean that 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 puts so much uh, weight on on yeah. on yeah. my my own yeah. my own perception that it seems ridiculous, uh, but. That's... Yeah, solipsism, it's called solipsism, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is a, there's an element of intellectual arrogance. And also that's a, that's a doorway to uh, a philosophical anarchy, in fact, in a kind of intellectual anarchy. You know? Everything is in mind only. That can be very dangerous and very, very misleading. View. In fact, there are many, even uh, many, unfortunately, so to speak, many, scholars who have not studied Vedanta properly, who would tell you that Shankaracharya taught this world is like an, like an unreal. Shankaracharya did not teach the world is unreal in the absolute sense. That's why, you know, I quoted this Bhashya where Shankaracharya, he, he takes pains to tell you that, no, the external world, the world that we see in front of us, this have an existence, but not in the absolute sense. See, the sutra is na bhavaha ubalabdhege. The meaning is this very simple. You see, external objects do not have non-existence. That's the real meaning of the sutra. Na bhavaha ubalabdhege. The reason is because they are perceived. An external world, external object is perceived. Therefore, you cannot say they do not have existence uh, because you don't, that perception doesn't remain in your mind. That's why, he, <laughs> and he uses the word Bahyarthavadam. Bahyarthavadam means, this is actually, it's a uh, uh, Buddhist scholars. Anyway, anyway, so the idea is Shankaracharya makes it very clear that external objects do not have non-existence. External objects do not have non-existence. That's the meaning of this. Now, abhavaha. Abhava means non-existence. Na means no. That's meaning. For bahyarthanam na bhavaha. In that sense, that's the idea behind it. External objects do not have non-existence. That's the meaning of the sutra. <laughs> Sanskrit construction is a bit uh, roundabout, you know. That's the language, the structure of the language, the, the style of the language. So I'm sure that uh, our audience have fully enjoyed this most profound philosophical discussions. You know, thank you. Oh, we Maharaj, will... there were more questions. I okay, see then most well. welcome, most welcome. Yeah, yeah, most welcome, please. Maharaj, um, I think uh, today I got it. I said that the existence, the object exists because of the perception, the, because of the chitta. Now, what is the whole point of this? Is it a foundation for a future discussion? No, no. The point is, uh, I, I, okay, you are asking this, this very important question. The point is, yoga philosophers, they their view with regard to the ontological status of the universe, the world, the different from the view of Vijnanavadis. So one of the possible uh, answers to your question is that during the time when Vyasa wrote these commentaries, most, this Vyasa, you have to remember, most probably this Vyasa must have been a Vyasa, other than the Vyasa who wrote Mahabharata, including Bhagavad Gita or the one who edited the Vedas. This, you know, Vyasa, there were so many Vyasas. So this is one of the, uh, one of the proof that there are so many Vyasas. When Vyasa wrote this commentary, most probably, you have to remember the historical context. 
this 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 view of you know the subject to idealism the main the view that external objects do not have any ontological status any any status of reality that view must have been raging in those times today if you are writing a book on philosophy you have to bring in many uh, many views in philosophy uh, and, and uh, logic which are current in our times so unless you get an idea of the evolution of indian thought and unless you get an idea why you may ask the question why shankaracharya worried so much about what bimam sir telling no but yeah. the, when you see it very I, and the, the, the intel uh, yeah. uh, infosys whatever maybe in india wherever we, we don't see any bimam sir uh, conducting ritual vedic rituals so why shankaracharya worried so much you have to think of the times in which he lived similarly you know when kant for example we talks about actually kant was responding to influence of phenomenalism and again this subject to idealism kant didn't agree with this kant refuted this critical pure reason so you may ask the question why kant bothered about this you have to ask kant who lived much in an earlier era similarly when vyasa wrote this canon let me remember perhaps this view must have been great the raging the most popular uh, subject for discussion those times as you there remember the historical context somebody will i know the many people were terribly offended why shankaracharya asked this highly um, uh, complicated questions and arguments and logic and epistemology and hermeneutics why did he make a statement clearly but you have to think of the times in which he lived and his mission Sri Ramachandra lived in 19th century, later half of 19th century. I mean, he he taught in the later half of 19th century. Look at Sri Ramachandra's style; very simple. Sri Ramachandra doesn't take pains to uh, refute the Mimamsagas or, or the Charvakas and <laughs> Sunnivadins because they were not there anywhere to be seen in Calcutta when Sri Ramachandra lived. So he talks about the simple believers, different people, you know, this uh, this. Keshav Chandra Sen, Brahma Samaj. They were the raging people. So Sri Ramachandra also Brahma Samaj, new new Brahma Kyanis, Brahma Samaj, and he's talking about people who have different views, religions. So similarly, a great teacher when he leaves and teaches, he has to. He, in one way, he is a product of his times. Secondly, you can find he is the result of a revolution of it. spiritual intellectual philosophical culture sri ramakrishna taught the same that eternal vedic truths but using different vocabulary different analogies different similes uh, di- uh, because he lived in different context historical context christ christ again you know he lived in entirely different uh, in a di- different time different age so the language he used the similes the analogies he used were uh, the right uh, the, the right ones for those times look at buddha's um, jataka tales you can find that the analogies the illustrations he used they belong to an ancient era so we have to remember the context historical context but the truth is the same historical context is different okay thank you there is another question yeah go ahead kathleen Uh, Maharaj, um, I understand it um, that when a person <laughs> there's an echo here. Um, when a person <clears throat> uses as much of their understanding and knowledge to attain or reach Brahman. or their atma and um there comes a certain point where their knowledge is no longer useful yeah for for getting there and from what i understand is there are certain sages and saints yeah who have uh realized brahman and i think they say when that happens the world disappears there is there is no 
Yeah. There is no relative world. Is that correct? Okay. The world as world disappears. The world exists as non-different from Brahman. This is an important thing. You know, the world disappearing, that should be understood in, in the correct Vedantic sense. What it means is, I can, uh, I can, again, I can explain this in the light of the classical analogy illustration, because the ancient illustration is so apt and we, uh, right on the spot. See the dark room, suppose it's semi-dark room, there's some light, not enough light, so an object is lying on the floor. It, it can be mistaken to be a snake because there's not enough light. The shape, the color, the size, everything makes you feel, well, it could be a snake. It could be, of course, there are different options given Vedanta literature, Jaladhara, Danda, Guchitra, and so on. But Sarpa, that it may, people may mistake with that object is a snake, but actually it is a rope. It's a rope, but it's mistaken to be a snake because there is not enough light. When you bring light, what happens? The snake doesn't run away from you. The object that you earlier mistook to be a snake is now perceived in the broad light to be what it is. It is a rope. Now, similarly, when you reach that, uh, the highest Advaitic experience, the world as you see it, it does disappear. But the world is again perceived to be non-different from Brahman. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Satyam is the highest experience. Brahma Satyam, Jagat Mithya is the philosophical conclusion. When we evolve towards that experience, we, 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 we want to realize Brahman. And then when we realize Brahman, this world doesn't go away as such. The world as we earlier understood, this world is because before we realize the truth of Brahman, we think this world is the only reality. This world is the only absolute reality. There is nothing else. That world disappears. This world is again perceived to be non-different from Brahman. The object that you earlier mistook to be a snake is now properly understood to be the rope it is. Similarly, what happens, you know, when a person reaches Brahman, he may be living this world, but in his mind he knows this world as it's name and form, it is not eternal. Mm -hmm. It is coming and going. That feeling will be always the, as a deep inner conviction. When does it work? When you, something happens, when, when you lose money, when somebody gets some news from the doctor, well, health is not good. He's not shocked. Or she's not shocked because he understands, well, this body is bound to fall sick one day or another because this body is not eternal. Like this world is not eternal. So that proper mature understanding is the only difference between a, pers a person who has attained Brahmajnana and a person who has not attained Brahmajnana. That's the only difference. Sri Ramakrishna also fell sick, but for him, the sick body was not his reality. Yeah. He didn't worry about the body. Falls all right, fine, no problem. He was. He did not cry and weep and worry and complain. No. He also underwent some treatment. He, he was willing to take some treatment, but he was not weeping and crying. Okay, cancer. That's the nature of the body. And he didn't worry about it. He did not even pray for uh, to Mother Divine Mother for remedy. Because the body is coming and going. So actually, when we are able to look upon our own body as if we are looking a stick that we are holding in our hand. Suppose you're holding a stick in your hand or a chair, somebody hits the chair, you don't feel a pain. Because that person is not hitting you, he's hitting only the chair that is holding your hand. Similarly, we are able to, when we dissociate ourselves from this body identity, 
we are able to look upon this body of ours as is it is not our, not ours it's like a, a chair you're holding your hand if it falls sick all right it fall it should fall sick no problem so that's the only difference between a brahmajnani and a ignorant person okay thank you please continue um the example of the snake and the stick is that because um when we're in the relative world we see the snake and we fear and um it could mean death and it 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 leads to um not understanding the the reality the divine reality but when we uh, when a person reaches the state like our juna was looking for and krishna was uh, um helping us towards if you see the snake if you if you see a snake it couldn't possibly be dangerous because there's no success no failure no good or bad but it is an object but it's brahman it's all one is that why the snake and the stick are you, you know yeah about? yeah you know the snake and rope analogy is used only in a limited context so we should not take an example beyond the context example is only only partially justified this is a central principle in vedantic logic an example should only be taken in its limited context so here the only con the only sense in which it is to be to be understood is so long as we don't pursue the reality for what it is we will have a lot of misunderstandings when we really get the higher experience then our earlier misunderstandings will not be will not bother us okay so that should be an important point when we reach that experience then these questions will not arise at all okay that's why example should not be uh chased followed beyond its narrow limited context beyond that example is no meaning suppose you the example you know many there are many examples we don't we don't go deeper into examples examples are meant to play very limited role this is a central principle in vedanta drishtan drishtan that means example drishtan that means what it tries to exemplify so there is a limited context in which they should be understood not beyond that mm -hmm. so when we actually reach a kind of experience the many of the earlier questions that we may ask those questions are not answered those questions cease to be questions mm -hmm. we laugh at ourselves i actually raised this question how foolish it was on my part to raise this question because questions are not really answered in spiritual life you transcend that level in which you you ask those questions so questions are no more questions that's so why questions disappear they don't get answers they just disappear okay thank you thank you thank you thank you thank you so now i have some very important announcement for all of you uh, that is uh, one important announcement is um of course many of you attend the gita class there will be no bhagavad gita class uh, from next friday onwards the next bhagavad gita class is friday um, uh, january 21st and remember uh, we have a christmas program on december 25th 11 am christian values in 21st century that's a subject of discussion uh december 25th 11 am saturday the talk is at 11 am christian values in the 21st century uh this is an important thing and again we have an important celebration january 1st saturday january 1st 2022 10 am we have puja worship uh, fire ceremony in the uh, new temple 2323 velu street so to attend please rsvp only on a website svedanta.org and it should be done by december 23rd 
RSVP. And then another very important information is an announcement regarding winter retreat. Our annual winter retreat will take place on January 8th and 9th, 2022. The topic for discussion during this winter retreat is climate change and human behavior, Vedic and Vedantic perspectives. Winter retreat is only for two days, one session on each day from 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. One hour lecture, 30 minutes interaction, question answer. Saturday 8th uh, January and Sunday 9th January, 10 a.m. to 11.30 a.m. And then please remember there will be uh, no class on Patanjali Yoga Sutras from now onwards. So uh, we have uh, winter, winter races and uh, we will from 26th uh, December to 15th uh, January and our next uh, Padanjali Yoga Sutra classes will be only after 15th uh, January then the 16th, yeah, 15th January will be uh, the last day of winter races. So please remember there will be no Padanjali Yoga Sutra classes during the uh, Christmas races. Maharaj, does that, does that mean the next Yoga Sutra class is Sunday, January 16th? Yeah, it will. The next, uh, yeah, the next uh, Padanjali Yoga Sutra classes will be January 16th, uh, Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please remember next Yoga Sutra class on January 16th, Sunday. And happy new year, happy Christmas all for all of you. Thank you, Namaskar. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsu Sri Ramakrishna Pranamastu.